Welcome back, everyone. This is lecture number 19. We are going to talk about vaccines. Vaccines are our proven best defense against viruses. And they work by mobilizing our immune system to prevent infection. They give us memory, so they immobilize the adaptive immune response. And as you will see, they break the chain of transmission. For the most part, they do not prevent infection, but they do prevent disease and death. And vaccines are one of the reasons why our life expectancy has increased steadily since, well, on this graph, the 1900s, but even before that, you know, if you were born in 1900, you could live maybe 30, 45, 50 years at the most, and now uh, 70 plus years. Vaccines, medicines, public health measures, sewers and toilets, all of those had played a role. And this is a dip in 1918, which is, of course, the consequence of the 1918 flu pandemic. And I'm, I'm wondering, I'm sure we'll have a dip in uh, life expectancy as a consequence of the COVID pandemic. What vaccines do is they stimulate a protective immune response. Here's a slide we have seen before where we're looking at either antibodies or T cells with time after your first infection and then later when you reinfect it. So at your first infection, you have an initial immune response, which comprises antibodies and T cells, which peaks in a week or two. And then after infection, uh, the titers decline to a low level, not zero, but very low uh, in the blood in terms of antibodies and in tissues for T cells. And then of course, when you uh, are infected years later, you have memory so you can respond much more quickly more specifically and with higher affinity. So you store memory B and T cells that can respond quickly, but they don't respond immediately. It takes a few days. And so even if you're immune, you will still get infected, but the antibodies and T cells will limit the infection. They will limit transmission and they will limit death and disease, or I should say disease and death. That's how they work. And you know the whole dialogue around the COVID vaccines, are they gonna prevent transmission? Yes, that's how vaccines work. They're not gonna prevent infection. And you'll see more of that today. First vaccine developed by Jenner in 1796 against smallpox. He observed that milkmaids never got smallpox. He, li he worked in the UK. They got cowpox pustules instead, it didn't kill them. He took the cowpox pustules uh, and he uh, scraped them into the skin of a young boy. And then two weeks later, he challenged the boy with pustules of smallpox. And that boy was protected. Good thing he waited two weeks, right? <laughs> and not like four days would have killed the boy. And now it, that led to the development of the smallpox vaccine, which eradicated smallpox on the globe. Today, the vaccine is scraped into the outer layers of skin with this bifurcated needle. It has a drop of vaccine in it. It's still used for the military and other individuals. Pasteur made the next vaccine, a rabies vaccine, in 1885. He called it vaccine after cow, the Latin for cow in honor of Jenner. And then subsequently, yellow fever and influenza vaccines were developed in the 1930s. How do we determine which vaccine will have a longer immunological memory? Pretty much empirically, we test vaccines to prevent disease and death, and then we see how long they last. And it turns out some of them are not so good. Some of the flu vaccines don't have great memory. We have to fix it. Now, shortly after Jenner's vaccine, the anti-vaxxers arose. And here is a, a print of you know, the, the wonderful effects of the new inoculation from the anti-vaccine society in Jenner's time already, they thought, oh, if you take this vaccine, you're gonna get cow parts growing out of your skin. The anti-vaxxers have always been with us and they will never go away, unfortunately. We have now used large scale vaccination campaigns to reduce many infectious diseases. These are done on massive scale. Here's the polio campaign, which has nearly eradicated polio globally, as you'll see in a bit. Measles vaccine has nearly eradicated measles where it's used, but of course there are people who don't use it, anti-vaxxers, so we still have measles. Here on the right is a graph of the lives saved by measles vaccination over the years. Here would be the deaths in the absence 
and the deaths in the present. So millions of deaths averted. These are good things to be using. Vaccines are now an integral part of our existence. We immunize children, of course. We immunize adults, even old folks with shingles vaccine. And we, we immunize our pets and we immunize farm animals, chickens, pigs. We even immunize fish. We even immunize wild animals to prevent rabies. We drop bait from helicopters into the forest and the bait is laced with rabies vaccine. It actually cuts down on wild rabies and that's where it goes into the dogs typically. Many childhood diseases are now rare and vaccines have become a major part of Western nations, public health measures. The first thing we thought about uh, as soon as COVID arose. However, de developing nations, as you know, they do not vaccinate efficiently and therefore their outbreaks of diseases, rubella and measles. Now vaccines work by inducing population level immunity, herd immunity, this is called. Unfortunate name, but that's what we're stuck with. And it means we have to maintain a critical level of immunity in the population. What does it mean? So we have here on the lower left, all these people are colored black. They're not immune, so they can be infected if someone is shedding virus. Uh, if you're now vaccinated or immune in some way, you're green here. Uh, the red infected person cannot transmit to them. So the people who are not immunized are indirectly protected because transmission is cut down in the population. And on the right, everyone is immune, but that's not always the case. It's not always the case that we can immunize everyone. We don't have to. So herd immunity is about stopping spread when the probability of infection drops below a threshold. The threshold is virus and population specific, and it depends in part on the R0, as we discussed earlier. That's the average number of people who are infected by an infected person. And so the, the fraction of the population you need to be immune to stop smallpox is between 80 and 85%. Measles, 93 and 95%. Very high because the R0 is high. Complicating this is the fact that no vaccine is 100% effective. Not everybody makes an immune response. Article in the New York Times today. Some people will get infected after vaccination. Really? That's an article? If we have 90% efficacy, those 10%, of course, they're going to get disease. I don't understand why that's news. And when you immunize, for example, 80% of the population with a measles vaccine, only 76% are actually immune. So 4% do not respond to the vaccine. That's just human genetic variation. So here's the number for SARS-CoV-2. The R0 is 2 to 3. So the number of people who must be vaccinated to prevent spread is 1 minus 1 over the R0, 50 to 70%. We can do that. We're approaching it in many places. Israel has already exceeded it. Remember, even though we've reached herd immunity, there are going to be people who are not immune and the virus will find them at some point. So there will be infections. Remember that R0 is a formula that includes uh, virus characteristics like duration of infectivity, but also human characteristics like average duration of contact between the infected and uninfected hosts. That's very hard to determine. So if you, if you tell me that the R0 of some variant has gone up, I don't believe you because you haven't ruled out the human factor, which is always the case when there are outbreaks. We're going to achieve herd immunity, and that's, I think, already causing the outbreak to subside. Now, the problem with vaccination, we can make vaccines, as you saw, very quickly. But there's vaccine hesitancy, which is a danger to any vaccination program. You know, the ability of a program to succeed is based on these three factors. Trust of people in the vaccine, confidence, complacency, perception that the risks are low and vaccines are not necessary, and convenience. Can you get people to go get it? It's not easy for working people to go often. And many people are not even convinced that COVID-19 is worth getting vaccinated. We need to have informational programs as well. Anyway, these are some of the things people say as reasons for not getting vaccinated. Kids should get infected naturally. Really? With the possibility that they die or have debilitation? It's ridiculous. I can't afford to immunize my kids. Well, that may be an issue. It should be free. In fact, in many countries, it is free. 
should be free in the U.S. I don't see why it's not. In some cases, you can have a medical exemption to vaccination, but they should not exceed 1% of the population. In some places in Texas, the medical exemptions are 50% because you go to your doc, I don't want my kid vaccinated, they give you a medical exemption, and they shouldn't be. And if they don't, they lose their patients. It's horrible. There are also religious exemptions which, which should not be allowed at all, in my view. Many states are outlawing them. It's just another excuse not to be vaccinated. Anyway, this uh, we had a few docs on TWIV 496 to talk all about this, as well as autism and so forth, worth listening to. So in the end, vaccine programs depend on public acceptance of their value. And these people who are anti-vax often congregate in communities of some kind often religious communities. So for example, and this is old because this outbreak was a while ago, 58 cases in Brooklyn, all members, unvaccinated members of an Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn. The rabbi said, don't, don't take the vaccine. You should be naturally infected. What does a rabbi know about vaccines and infectious diseases? They listen to their leader and they get infected. Here, Hare Krishna community in North Carolina, a church in Texas was critical of measles vaccination. I would like to talk to the leader of that church and say, what do you know about vaccines and epidemiology and disease? So he tells his congregation to not get vaccinated and they get sick. It's totally crazy. This drives me nuts. Anyway, there are outbreaks all over the country like this. And that's why we have measles throughout the years in the U.S. still. There was a big outbreak in Westchester last year. Same thing. Orthodox Jewish community. The rabbi said, don't get vaccinated. Those are you going to be doctors. You're going to have to deal with this. You better tell people to get vaccinated. Don't give them a medical exemption unless they need it. Like if they're immunosuppressed and so forth, they may get a medical exemption. Let's have a quiz here. All right. Herd immunity. A, dem demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock. B emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. C emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population. D describes how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices. All of the above. You know, I have to say, I used, to, I lecture medical students, right? And whenever I mention herd immunity, a few people moo. Most all of you got number two. Not everyone must be immune. That's correct. I'm glad no one picked A. Uh, that's a good sign. Uh, everyone must be immune is the, is the opposite, right? So two kinds of vaccines, active and passive. An active vaccine, we put a modified form of the pathogen or a piece of it into you, and that induces an immune response in you, and that gives you memory, so it has long-term protection. A passive vaccine, we give you the products of the immune response. So in theory, this could be antibodies or immune cells, the only passive vaccines that we use are antibody-based vaccines, like the rabies passive vaccine. It's uh, immunoglobulin uh, harvested from people who have been vaccinated with rabies vaccine. So if you get bitten by a rabid animal, you know, you have actually um, uh, about two weeks, depending on where the bite is, before the virus gets into your brain and kills you. So you can be vaccinated in that time. But before they do, they actually inject you uh, inject you with rabies immune uh, antibodies. Of course, these don't last per forever. They give you short-term protection. Uh, but they're useful also in other cases as well as we'll see. So uh, your mother gives you some antibodies during your gestation. We call this a natural passive vaccine. The antibodies are transferred across the placenta. So here is a fraction of adult values of these antibodies. With time here, we have conception, we have birth, and you can see the, 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 the red is the maternal antibody, maternal IgG. Uh, at birth, you have a lot. You, so you have her immune experience. Reason is because your uh, immune system doesn't develop until maybe nine months. Makes low affinity IgM first, and, but the IgG and A come later as the maternal antibodies decline. So that's a passive vaccine. The baby's immune system ramps up and then the baby can make their own. I like this story of um, Lassa fever. This is Nurse Pinio. She was working in Nigeria, and she got Lassa fever in the 60s. She was brought uh, back to uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, and she recovered. Uh, meanwhile, this guy, Yordi Casals, he's a virologist working at Yale. He was working on the virus, and he infected himself. 
So he they brought him to Colombia and they because he lived in the neighborhood and they gave him Penny Pinio's serum. Shouldn't be blood here. Actually, maybe they transfused him. I don't remember. I, I would guess they would give him serum. And it saved his life. I, we think. Maybe he would have recovered anyway. But that's a great story of convalescent serum. And it's been used in many other cases. And of course, there are ongoing trials now of convalescent plasma for COVID-19 patients. It's not clear to me that they actually work. Often they're given too late. You need to give these antibodies early before the virus titers are low, as we've mentioned before. Ebola virus antibodies were used in the uh, big West African outbreak, uh, antibodies against the spike protein of Ebola virus. And of course, now we are using monoclonal antibodies to treat uh, COVID, made by a couple of companies. Here is Lilly's unpronounceable monoclonal antibody. They're actually a different ones against different epitopes. Here is a structure of the um, spike receptor binding domain, which would be um, this green part here of the spike, and there's ACE2 bound to it. And these, this is one antibody binding to RBD that would interfere with attachment. Regeneron's also making these. Historically, they can be made in a couple of ways. You can make monoclonal antibodies in mice, and then you, you do what we call chimerization. You get rid of most of the mouse protein sequence in the antibody. You just leave the antibody combining portion or the antigen combining portion, uh, and you replace the rest with human sequences. Otherwise, the, you would make an antibody response against the monoclonal and clear it really quickly. Nowadays, we can isolate B cells from patients and identify monoclonals from them that way, and they're already human, so they're beautiful, and that's how these were identified. But uh, as I said, I'm not confident that these are making any difference they have to be given intravenously. They're often given when you're really sick. They're trying now to give them to people who test positive and are at risk for serious disease like other comorbidities, obesity, diabetes, and other diseases. It's hard to do that. It's hard to know who's going to get sick. Anyway, so that's passive antibodies. It's all we'll talk about there. What are the requirements for an effective vaccine? Let me see. There are a couple of questions here. Why don't we vaccinate everyone for rabies? Too rare. It's too rare, and um, we don't um, we don't want to immunize people for rare diseases. So we wait till you get bitten, and as I said, you have time to immunize people. Rabies is one of those diseases where you can be vaccinated after you're exposed to the virus. Most of the other viruses, they proceed too quickly to be able to do that, but rabies takes two weeks most of the time. You know, if you're bitten on an arm or a leg, it takes two weeks. Now, if you're bitten on the face, that's not going to take two weeks to get to your brain for obvious reasons. So be careful when you kiss raccoons, okay? Because they carry rabies. Requirements for an effective vaccine. Uh, you need to make an appropriate immune response. Remember, there's Th1 versus 2 responses. Uh, CTLs versus antibody production. Most of the time, we don't know which one is more important. We mostly focus on making good antibodies, which has been the case with COVID vaccines. We measure antibodies in T cells, but mostly we do neutralization assays and say, yeah, the antibodies are good. And we never do functional T cell assays. So you need to do an appropriate response. Mostly, it mostly says we give people the vaccine. We'll see if they make antibodies in T cells. We'll see if they're protected and try and make a correlation. And of course, you have to be protected against disease. Uh, just making antibodies isn't good enough. You have to do a clinical trial where you say, does this vaccine prevent disease? You do not ask if it prevents infection, although now they're doing that for these vaccines. It's not going to prevent infection, for sure. It's going to prevent disease, though. That's how vaccines work for the most part. The vaccines have to be safe, right? Minimal side effects. No vaccine is 100% without side effects. Like polio vaccine can paralyze you. One in one and a half million kids get paralyzed by the polio vaccine. They have to induce protective immunity in a population. It has to be long-lasting protection, although you can't plan for that. You just have to make something and hope that it lasts. It has to be cheap. WHO wants less than a buck. Genetically stable if you're making infectious vaccines. It'd be nice if you didn't have to freeze it. That's been a big issue with COVID vaccines, right? And delivery... You know, we all the COVID vaccines pretty much are needle delivery. That's hard. Needles are expensive. You have to know how to use a needle. Not just anyone can use it. If you could deliver vaccines orally, that would be great. The polio vaccine is orally delivered, cheap and easy to do. Um, and then there's some other approaches that were 
developing that that will replace the needle, I think, at some point. Anyway, this picture down here is a a doer. It's kind of a freezer. You put vaccines in with uh, dry dry ice or liquid nitrogen, and you can deliver the vaccines to remote areas where there may not be freezers. WHO has helped develop those. So let's talk about different kinds of vaccines. These are all the kinds that I know of. You start with a virus, you can make an infectious vaccine that doesn't cause disease. That's called an attenuation process. We can inactivate with chemicals. We can break it up and purify non-recombinant subunits. And the modern way, we can use recombinant DNA where we could say, take a gene of interest in the virus for SARS-CoV-2, it's spike, of course. Uh, we could produce spike protein. That's the Novavax vaccine. We can use the DNA to make an mRNA vaccine. That's a brand new one this year. And that last year's lecture didn't have mRNA vaccine in it because they'd never been used in people. We tried DNA vaccines and they don't seem to work well in people. Or we can use vectors like adenoviruses to deliver the gene of interest. And that's, of course, happening with COVID-19 vaccines. The, uh, the, when you produce the protein, for some viruses, the, depending on what protein you use, it can assemble into a, a capsid. That's a virus-like particle vaccine, and we have some of those as well. So I want to explore each of these with examples of them. And here is a list of vaccines licensed in the U.S. You can see them all here. Um, the type of vaccine, you know, attenuated, inactivated, recombinant. Most of these are traditional vaccines. Who gets them? Some vaccines are just for the military, adenovirus vaccine just for the military. Some are for travelers. Hepatitis A, we don't immunize people in the U.S. unless you're traveling somewhere where there is hep A. Hep B goes to everybody. You should get it. Another travel vaccine here, universal vaccination of infants. So some of them are, are infants. Some of them are specific people. And then the schedule here. The COVID vaccines are not licensed. They are authorized. Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. &J. Pfizer, Moderna, mRNA, of course, J&J is an ad 26 vector. They are authorized. They have emergency use authorization because the phase three usually takes two years to complete it. It's been accelerated because we're in an emergency. And some people have used that as an excuse to say they're not safe, but that's not true. All the safety concerns really are are addressed already, that what's addressed in two years is the durability, not safety. It's the durability. So we don't know how long they're going to last because we haven't gone two years. Ebola vaccine is licensed in the U.S. It can be used if we ever had Ebola here, but it's used in West Africa. So in an activated vaccine, you take, why is adenovirus recommended for the military? Because mostly that's where you have outbreaks you bring all these people together who've never seen each other for all, from all parts of the country, boom, you have big outbreaks of adenoviruses. They can get sick and, and then they can't be trained if they're sick, right? Then that's not what the military wants to do. So we vaccinate them. We take the virus, we inactivate it with chemicals like formalin, propiolactone, detergents. You test in the lab, make sure your virus is inactivated. And you, you're basically removing infectivity, but not compromising antigenicity. You have to check that, right? You do plaque assays, not PCR. You need to do plaque assays. And a great example is polio vaccine. Would the J&J &J vaccine be effective in someone who's received adeno? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. The J&J &J is an adenovirus. You mean that military adeno? It's a different vaccine. The one in the recruits is not serotype 26, which is the J&J &J vaccine. So there's no issue there. All right. Poliomyelitis is the inflammation of the gray matter. And from this 1959 textbook, a common acute viral disease, which is funny because now if you look in a textbook of medicine, you wouldn't even find it. Brief febrile illness, sore throat, headache, vomiting often with stiffness of the neck and back. In many cases, a lower neuron paralysis develops. That would be one in 100 cases. This is the curve of polio in the U.S. from 1900 to the present. You can see became epidemic in the early 1900s, as I've told you before. After World War II, all the new kids born, the baby boomers, added to the number of cases. They got infected. So we made a vaccine. Now it's been... Uh, eliminated from many parts of the world. It's, called by it's caused by poliovirus, of course, and in hospitals in the 30s and 40s and 50s in the U.S., they're full of iron lungs. We didn't have intubation machines. 
It's a good thing we didn't because they're bad. They can really mess you up. Putting a tube in your lung and pushing six liters of oxygen a minute. Uh, these are better. They breathe for you by negative pressure. You slip into these and the chamber has a membrane, a diaphragm that expands and contracts. And we don't have any more of these, but we should have, could have used them for COVID. It would have probably saved more lives. Anyway, they're all gone because there's no more polio. And uh, the FDR, president of the US, had polio in his 20s. Couldn't walk. He needed uh, crutches and had leg braces and he was in a wheelchair. He raised the money to make the, the two different polio vaccines I'm going to talk about you talk to you about today. And one of them is the inactivated vaccine, which I've, I've mentioned, developed by Jonas Salk, treated with formalin, clinical trial in 1954, paid for by money raised by uh, Roosevelt's foundation, 1.8 million children. Can you imagine? You know, these COVID trials are 40,000 people, right? 1.8 million children in 1954. There were no computers. You had to keep the records on index cards. I don't know. Do you guys know what an index card is? It's a piece of small piece of paper you have to write on, and then you can't lose it because there's no backup. It's amazing that they were able to do that. The biggest clinical trial ever done, 50% protection. That's not a lot. And then it was licensed right away. And these are the headlines. Within a few months after the vaccine was released, one company, Cutter Labs, they hadn't followed the procedure for inactivation correctly, and they released a vaccine with infectious virus in it. So it caused polio and was a big controversy, and that led to modern-day product litigation. Anytime someone gets injured by some product, uh, you can sue them, and the idea was established that even if they did follow the procedures, the fact that they're selling something that hurts you makes them liable. So polio virus, you recall from our discussion in acute infections, it's acquired by fecally contaminated material you ingest. It goes into your intestine where it reproduces in the mucosa and is shed in high numbers. But in one in 100 people, reaches the uh, central nervous system through the blood. There's a viremia in just about everyone. And when you get inactivated polio vaccine, the antibodies in your blood will block the infection so you don't get paralysis. And we introduced the inactivated vaccine in 55. It was used until 62 and got rid of most of the polio in the US, but didn't completely eliminate it. This vaccine does not prevent infection, but that's old history. Nobody reads it. Nobody remembers it. It didn't. It prevents disease. And that's all we cared about. No more paralyzed kids. We don't really care that the virus is still circulating. Another inactivated vaccine, influenza virus. Influenza virus, of course, enveloped. Uh, viruses with segmented genomes, spikes in the membrane, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And there are three types of flu. We vaccinate against A and B. And we have an inactivated vaccine because flu can cause up to 50,000 deaths a year in the U.S. Every year, three to 50,000 deaths. So we grow the virus in chicken eggs. We formulate it inactivate it or disrupt it. Make a lot of vaccine every year. A lot of chicken eggs go to this manufacturer. Actually, actually, when you get a flu vaccine, it's about one egg's worth of, of virus. And it's, it's about 60% effective in, in kids and adults less than 65. It's much less effective in older people. And, and part of the reasons are that there's no good memory and there's prob they probably need more antigen. So now there's a high dose vaccine for them. I joke that when I get my flu vaccine, I get the old person vaccine, I get the high dose. And protection correlates with antibodies against the two surface proteins. Now we, we can make them in cell culture, so we, we don't have to use just eggs. But just the eggs are much more efficient. The problem with flu vaccines is uh, the envelope proteins change each year, and we, we need to make new strains that we select in the first few months. So this is not a big deal to change the vaccine every year. People are freaking out with COVID vaccines. Oh, my gosh, we're going to have to make a new vaccine every few years. Just read the literature, folks, and learn what's been done. And to make these vaccines, uh, we, we make reassortants. We have a high yielding strain that grows really well in eggs and we swap out all the genes except the HA and the NA. And that is for the, the currently circulating strain. So this is what you would get if you got a flu vaccine this year. It has a, an H1N1 uh, subtype. It has an H3N2 and it has two B viruses. And these just changed this year compared to last year. So there's a quadrivalent vaccine, four different viruses to protect you against the two circulating A 
viruses and the two circulating B viruses. Would a person who gets flu vaccine every year have a greater overall immunity compared to a person who got their flu vaccine for the first time that year? For, for influenza, the very first virus you see tends to predominate your memory. So if you were infected in 1918 with H1N1 and you survived, and then in 1968 you got H3N2, you would make a lot of H1N1 antibodies and less against H3N2. That's called original antigenic sin, by the way. Very colorful name for it. And we're trying to get around that. So this is the process for selecting a flu vaccine. I had an expert on TWIV about talking about this. But basically, WHO does surveillance globally to find out if they can predict what strains are going to be circulating in the next season. In January, they, they select the strains. They prepare the high-yielding reassortants. They make the vaccine, uh, and they do some testing very limited testing, packaged, and then in, at the end of August, they can start vaccinating people. And uh, you know, the, then the flu season begins in October-ish. But you know, for older people, uh, you go in August to get your flu vaccine at CVS or Rite Aid, by February, your immunity is waned and you can get infected. It's a real issue. And the other issue, of course, is that the virus drifts antigenically. Single amino acid changes in, in these epitopes. Uh, this is the flu hemagglutinin. And these colored epitopes are where individual antibodies bind. Single amino acid changes can reduce their ability to prevent uh, disease. So we have to keep an eye on the changes that go on and make a decision. Some years we get it right. We match the vaccine with the circulating strains. And other years we do not and there's more disease that year. Uh, which statement about inactivated vaccines is incorrect? Chemicals can be used. They do not replicate. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. None of the above are incorrect. Why are RNA segments from only high yielding included? Because they, let, they allow the vaccine to grow really well in eggs. If you take a clinical isolate and try and grow it in eggs, you're not going to get enough to make a vaccine. So you take the HA and the NA, and those are the important proteins for antibody neutralization, and you reassort them into a strain that grows really well. So none of them are incorrect. Chemicals can be used to inactivate for sure. They do not replicate. These are inactivated vaccines. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Yeah, the cutter incident. Antigenic variation can make them ineffective. All these things are right. So most of you got that, but a few of you didn't. And subunit vaccines. You can either take virus and break it up, or you can clone the gene and make the protein in cells. And so spike COVID spike vaccine, Novavax is a purified protein spike vaccine. Um, and you can produce the protein in bacteria, yeast, insect cells, eukaryotic cell culture, Typically, this is a capsid protein or a membrane protein. If we use a capsid protein, the, you can make empty capsids. And we have some vaccines that, in fact, are those. So here's a, a recently developed vaccine. It's uh, against shingles, it's called Shingrix. Here's a varicella zoster virus. Remember, you first get it as a kid. You get ch chicken pox if you're not vaccinated. The virus goes latent in your in your ganglia innervating your skin. Then you get reactivation and, and shingles or zoster. And so for old folk like me, anybody over 50 that had measles as a kid didn't get the vaccine, they should get this vaccine. It is one of the viral spike proteins, glycoprotein E, produced in Chinese hamster ovary cells. It's a mammalian cell. It's secreted and purified, and it's mixed with an adjuvant and injected into your muscle. And it's really good. Protects against shingles. So you're not going to get that shingles anymore. I need to get this one of these days. Now, that's an example of a subunit vaccine, very much like the Novavax uh, spike vaccine for COVID. The hepatitis B virus vaccine is similar. It's a cancer vaccine. It prevents liver cancer. We take the hepatitis B surface antigen, which is this protein uh, that's in the viral membrane. We take the gene, we produce it in yeast. It assembles into empty particles. These particles here of different sizes 
They have no genome in them. They're just empty particles. We mix this with adjuvant and we inject it into people. So it's an example of how you can make a, a single protein and it will assemble into a capsid virus-like particle. Another example is the human papillomavirus vaccine. So these are viruses that look sort of like the polyomaviruses, SV40, circular double-stranded DNA. Uh, they, they cause warts. There are over 170 types of papillomaviruses. And they can all, inf you know, immunity to one um, will not prevent you, protect you against uh, another. And some of these are transmitted sexually. They're not all, you know, the warts you get on your finger or your arm, as this young lady has here. Uh, they're not transmitted sexually. You can get them on the bottom of your feet. You know, if you walk in locker rooms or showers, public showers without flip-flops, you're going to get warts on the bottom of your feet. You shouldn't do that. But some of them are sexually transmitted. They can cause what we call low-risk genital warts. Okay, you get genital warts. They're not a problem. But some of them go on to form cancer, and they can kill you. And these can be cervical, vaginal, penile, anal, oral pharyngeal cancers. We have 31,000 deaths in the U.S. from these alone. And they're mostly two types, 16 and 18. And, and nearly half of Americans are infected with genital herp, uh, human papillomaviruses of, the, of types. Uh, and that's uh, eight, ages 18 through 59. So here are two surveys that were done with men and women. You can see 45% uh, of, of men, 40% of women, and different rates for different groups as well. So this is a serious disease, and we've developed another anti-cancer vaccine. Uh, and these are made by taking the capsid protein, the L1 capsid protein gene. We produce protein uh, in yeast or insect cells. The, the protein assembles into empty virus-like particles. We purify them. We mix them with adjuvant. We inject them intramuscularly. And they give rise to antibodies that go to the uh, cervical mucosa, for example, and protect against infection. And this vaccine actually protects against infection. Yes, I meant to say that because you get so much protein, way more than a natural infection. It actually blocks infection, not just disease. Of course, it does block cancer. It blocks wart formation. It blocks cancer. So these are great vaccines. Uh, they're made by a number of different companies, different serotypes. As you can see, they've expanded them to many more just to protect against all cancers in yeast and insect cells. And you should get these before you become sexually active. How many parents don't want their kids to have these? I once uh, gave a talk at a high school, and I do that every year, and I talk about HeLa cells and Henrietta Lacks who had cervical cancer. And I said, you know, there's a vaccine. And every year somebody says, why doesn't my parent want me to get this vaccine? And I say, because they think if you get the vaccine, you will become sexually active, more active than you already are. You will be promiscuous. And they all laugh at me. And they're right. It's not going to make a difference. But the parents are just using it as an excuse not to vaccinate their kids. Anyway, it's a really good vaccine. Uh, there are going to be some new future influenza vaccines. I really like this one. Uh, they can make HA protein in plants. It assembles into virus-like particles. And this is Nicotiana benthamiana. They can make transgenic plants, for example. And one square meter will make 20,000 doses of vaccine at under 20 cents a dose. This is just amazing. This is in human trials now. I think this is uh, very attractive because you can make these very quickly. However, with the success of mRNA vaccines, it may be that the future flu vaccine is an mRNA vaccine. Why do doctors push the HPV more for females than males? So initially, it was only recommended for females because it was thought that if we immunized them, we could get rid of all the cancers. But as you know, men have sex with men. And it turned out that many men were having cancers despite immunizing the females. So that was a bad idea. And so now it's males and females for sure. And that doctor needs to read the literature and, and find out because now males and females have to be vaccinated. Subunit vaccine pro and cons, recombinant technology is fast. There are no genomes. There's no infectious virus. It's really good tech, but can be expensive. It has to be injected and it has poor antigenicity. Why? Viral proteins don't replicate. They don't infect, right? So they don't cause inflammation 
And remember, if you don't get inflammation, you get a poor adaptive response. So that's why we add adjuvants to cause inflammation when we give people a subunit vaccine. The Novavax COVID vaccine is a protein made in insect cells. It's, it's mixed with adjuvant. So you get a nice inflammation and you get a good antibody response. So what is an adjuvant? It, it's chemicals that stimulate immune recognition and make uh, a, a better immune response. They work in two ways. They tend to confine the antigen at the site of the inoculation. You know, one of the critics of vaccines called adjuvants hamburger helper. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like you can add it to, to hamburger meat to make more hamburgers and it's not meat, right? It's not what a, an adjuvant is. You have slow release of antigen at the site of inoculation and also stimulate inflammation. So here are some of the adjuvants that have been licensed aluminum hydroxide uh, or phosphate in the HPV vaccine. The Shingrix has ASO1, which is monophosphorolipid A. That's this. That's a TLR4 ligand. Stimulates TLR4, so you get inflammation. AS4 is in uh, the, one of the HPV vaccines. And uh, this uh, MF59 is an oil and water emulsion that's used in flu vaccines in Europe. All right, so non-replicating vaccines need adjuvants. Here are two new technologies that I think are coming, coming into play in the next years, five to 10 years. First, the microneedle patch. This is a small plastic patch with tiny needles in it, which go into your skin and the needles are coated with vaccines. So this can be put on your skin with a Band-Aid. It doesn't require a trained healthcare personnel. And these have shown really good results so far. I think that's gonna replace the needle. Uh, eventually. Skin is a better place to put vaccines, lots of dendritic cells there uh, than muscle even. And then thermostabilization with sugar. Who would have known? You can dry vaccines in sugar and it thermostabilizes them. Here's influenza vaccine and we're looking at inactivation of infectious, infectious uh, influenza virus vaccine at 40 degrees. So without sugar, you know, it's gone two days at 40 degrees Celsius. And if you have it in sugar, you know, you, you lose less infectivity. These are, this is the log 10 PFU scale. So this can get even better in places that don't have refrigerators, can really simplify distribution of vaccines. Another thing that's being worked on for influenza virus is to try and make a universal flu vaccine so that we don't have to change the vaccine every year. How would that work? Well, the hemagglutinin has epitopes on its top, on its tip which vary. Those are the ones that vary from year to year, but the stem epitopes do not. And those stem epitopes are neutralizing antigenic sites. They can give rise to neutralizing antibodies. So uh, the idea is to try and focus the immune response to this region. Now, when you get infected with a novel influenza virus, the head is immunodominant. The stem is immunosubdominant. That means you get more antibodies against the head than the than the stem. So we have to fool the immune response. So what we do is we make a recombinant HA, it's called chimeric here, where the head is some irrelevant subtype that doesn't infect people, H9 in this case. H9 doesn't circulate in people. And then the stem is the stem of a H1 here, which is a virus that does infect people and we want to protect against. So we, we inject with that, you make antibodies against the head and the stem. And then we boost with a different protein, with a different head, the same stem. And now you're gonna get a memory response on the stem, but very primary on the head. So it's gonna be focused on the stem and you can do it a third time as well. And this has turned out to be somewhat effective and it's still being studied, but I think it, it might eventually work in some form. What are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, provides long-lasting immunity, minimal side effects, all of the above. 100% all of the above. You got it. Good job. All right, attenuated vaccines. And these are vaccines where the virus is infectious. It's not inactivated. So the replication occurs, it stimulates an immune response, and either mild or no disease. Yeah, obviously, you don't want it to cause disease. And the idea is... 
you know, if you use an activated vaccine, sometimes you, you need multiple doses to get a good immune response, one or two or even three. Whereas a replication competent vaccine will, will reproduce on its own, right? So you don't have to give multiple doses. And these are usually empirically derived, although now we are learning how to actually engineer them. We can, in this example, we take a pathogenic virus and we pass it in monkey cells. We pass it extensively and the virus adapts to the monkey cell and then it doesn't cause disease in humans. And this is totally empirical. You do the passaging and then you test it. Flu mist is an example of an attenuated a vaccine, it's intranasally administered there. No needle, but just the syringe sprayed in your nose. Reproduces in your mucosal epithelial cells. Multivalent, just like the others. These are also reassortants. Uh, but in this case, we instead of using a high yield strain from eggs, we use cold adapted temperature sensitive attenuated strains, which have been tested to have those properties. In other words, they don't cause disease in ferrets. They're cold adapted, which means they re reproduce better in the upper tract. They are temperature sensitive, which means they won't go down to the lower tract. So their reproduction is restricted to the upper tract, nasopharynx, and they give you protective immunity. Really a, a very nice vaccine, but not many doses are made every year, so it's very hard to find it. But if, if I had a choice, that's the one I would, I would take. A Sabin oral polio vaccine is another example of an attenuated vaccine developed by Albert Sabin. It was introduced in the U.S. in 1962 and has now led to the eradication in many countries, including the U.S. This is a vaccine you ingest, reproduces in your intestinal tract, causes a viremia, but then it immunizes both your gut and your blood. So when you get infected, it will actually block uh, transmission. It will reduce transmission of the virus in the gut. Never block except for HPV vaccines. And that's different from IPV, which will allow extensive replication in the, muco in the uh, gut and transmission, but uh, OPV reduces transmission substantially. So Albert Sabin took the three serotypes of polio and he passed it in different ways, sort of like I said before, in cells, in different animals, plaque purifying, until after many years, he got three variants that did not cause disease uh, in animal models, and these were tested in humans and licensed in 1961. And in the 1980s, my lab and many others sequenced the genomes of these viruses, and we found the mutations that caused them to lose their ability to cause poliomyelitis. Very few mutations, as you can see here. And all three serotypes have a change in the non-coding region. And I've shown, I think I've shown you this before. Here's the genome of poliovirus. The five prime end is highly structured. And the three serotypes of Sabin oral polio vaccine have single base changes. Uh, in the five prime non-coding region that make them of substantially reduced ability to cause disease. Unfortunately, these viruses revert in the gut when in when kids are given them. So you give in the first year of life, you you get a polio vaccine and you you drink it, it reproduces in your gut. And this is an experiment done with a young boy in the UK, 1985, uh, where they they took his diapers every day and sequenced the uh, virus on the diaper because the vaccine strains excreted, of course. The Sabin has a U at 472, and in 35 hours, it had already reverted to a C, which is the, the, the base in the wild-type virus. And um, this happens actually in every person who gets the polio vaccine, but only one in a million, one in a million, 1.4 million kids get polio which is an unfortunate side effect. And in fact, in the US, this is, this is the cases of polio in the US from 60 to the present. In 1961, we introduced oral polio vaccine and that eradicated wild polio. Uh, in 19, Last year uh, of a wild case of polio in the US was 79, that's the straight line. But it replaced polio, wild polio, with vaccine-associated polio. All these gray bars are cases of kids who got paralyzed from the vaccine, up to 20 a year. And so in 2000, that was no longer considered acceptable so we switched to an inactivated polio vaccine, and now no more polio caused by the vaccine. I don't think this was ever really acceptable. It's, it's a real debate in the field. I don't think that this should have been used at all. But it's now being used in the eradication campaign. You know, the WHO said in 1988, we're going to eradicate polio by 2005 and stop immunizing. They haven't reached this goal, but they've done pretty well. 
That brings up the question of whether you can eradicate a, a viral disease. And smallpox eradication program was launched in 1967. It was eradicated in 78. There's no more smallpox in the world. Now, to eradicate a disease, a viral disease, two features are necessary. Replication only in one host. So if there's an animal in nature for your virus, forget it. And the vaccination has to induce lifelong immunity. And that was the case for smallpox, and that's the case for the polio virus vaccines. So the progress in eradication has been substantial. When they started in 1988, there were 125 polio endemic countries, 71 polio free. You can see a decade later, much lower. Another decade, 2008, just five polio endemic countries. And now there are only two countries in the world where polio is endemic, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Everywhere else we eradicated wild polio. We can't do it in, Pol in Pakistan and Afghanistan because the conflict caused by the Taliban prevents the vaccinators from doing their jobs. They shoot them. So they, the vaccinators don't wanna go in. If we could get in there, this would be gone. There were like 200 cases in 2020 in those two countries. Now, you may be wondering, what are these other dots, the green and the brown dots? Those are cases of vaccine-associated polio. So the green is type two. Uh, these viruses circulate after they're excreted. And if you drop immunization in any country, you're gonna get outbreaks of circulating vaccine-derived polio too. Look at the numbers. That's a lot. We have to get away from this attenuated vaccine, basically. We're switching back to uh, IPV. But in the meantime, some people have tried to make non-revertible strains. Someone asked, why does the vaccine revert in the gut? Because there's, the vaccine always has a little bit of C at 472. And that's selected for it. It helps the virus to reproduce better. It makes it more fit. And you can introduce uh, mutations in this region of the 5' prime UTR that reduce reversion. And these have actually been tested in people. Here's a, a um, phase one study where they tested these new strains and people who were already immune to polio by vaccination, they asked, do they revert? And they found lower uh, levels of reversion in these people. This is called new OPV2. And I think this is going to be licensed uh, in the next year or so and will replace OPV2 and hopefully that will get rid of the reversion problem. But you know, even if we eradicate a virus, as long as you have the sequence of the genome, you can recover the virus as I've shown you for the construction of a horse box virus, 350,000 base pairs. There's really no limit to what we can do. Nowadays, we don't make attenuated vaccines this way anymore. We engineer them. We don't do it empirically. And the first one was based on the yellow fever vaccine. That was the first human virus transmitted by mosquitoes, major disease, so we made the vaccine in 1938. That was an attenuated vaccine made by 176 passage of the wild type strain in chick embryos. Um, and we've so far distributed many doses of that vaccine and it's safe. To build on the success of that vaccine, we said, okay, let's, let's make a dengue virus vaccine. Dengue is the same family, flavivirus. So here's the vaccine uh, RNA. You make a DNA copy of it and you substitute the structural proteins here, PRME, the glycoproteins, with dengue virus proteins. And then you make recombinant viruses, and this is a vaccine. It's called Dengvaxia, made by Sanofi. Four serotypes of, uh, of dengue in a yellow fever vaccine backbone. It's been licensed in a number of countries. Unfortunately, it doesn't protect against dengue too, and actually leads to enhanced disease in young kids. So. Uh, it's been phased out in, in many countries, either phased out or uh, you have to uh, have evidence of previous infection before you can receive this. But the NIH has been developing an alternative dengue vaccine called TV3. And this is produced by mutagenizing an infectious copy of dengue virus. And so what they have done is introduce a 30 base deletion in the three prime untranslated region. And that virus one dose of that virus gives 100% protection in humans versus challenge. So this is, I think this is gonna replace Dengvaxia and a nice example of making an attenuated vaccine from scratch. So the 30 nucleotide deletion doesn't prevent reproduction of the virus, but in humans, it prevents disease. And that's of course what we want. So let me end on 
SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. This is a lovely figure from the Milken Institute of uh, a graphic representation of the vaccines in development, 251 in development, 61 in clinical testing, and 11 are actually being used. And, and here, um, the phases are shown at the right end here. Phase one, phase two, phase three, right? Phase one, safety, phase two, immunogenicity, phase three, efficacy. Does it prevent disease? And then we have the vaccine categories. And you, you should know all these. We've talked about them. Inactivated virus, attenuated, protein subunits, DNA and RNA based, replicating vectors, non-replicating vectors, virus-like particle. I mean, they're all being explored. Most of these are still being tested or developed. These are the ones that have been authorized, right? Pfizer mRNA, Moderna mRNA, Oxford AstraZeneca adenovirus, chimpanzee adenovirus vectored spike, and the J&J um, &J Janssen uh, adenovirus, human adenovirus vectored vaccine. Almost all of them, except for the attenuated vaccines, of course, and the inactivated vaccines, they're all based on spike, either mRNA or vectored. And remember, the spike protein attaches to ACE2 on the plasma membrane and leads to fusion. And when fusion occurs, the, the protein extends the fusion peptide here in cyan, cyan so that it, it inserts into the membrane. All these vaccines, with the exception of the AstraZeneca, encode a pre-fusion spike. They add two prolines uh, to the C-terminal uh, of the S2, and that prevents the fusion extension. It keeps it in this stable conformation. You get higher protein yields and better antigenicity. I don't know why AstraZeneca didn't use that. I think it's a mistake. But Moderna then takes that spike. They, have, they put it in a DNA plasmid with a T7 RNA polymerase II promoter. That's a phage RNA polymerase that we all use in the lab all the time to make RNA. They do in vitro transcription and they get mRNA. And, you know, in my lab, we can make nanograms of virus mRNA, for example. We're very happy. They're making kilograms, which I think is just phenomenal that they could scale it up. They take this mRNA, they wrap it in a lipid nanoparticle to protect it and act as an adjuvant. Similar technology by Pfizer. This is injected into your muscle. And most of the nanoparticles are taken up by antigen-presenting cells. Some are taken up by muscle cells. Uh, but, the, you know, the antigen-presenting cells, the dendritic cells, uh, they're going to take up the nanoparticle. The protein is going to be translated. It's going to be processed and displayed on the surface of the APC and MHC molecules, right? And then these APCs go into the lymph node and present it to T cells who will say, ah, it's foreign, and start to initiate antibody and T cell responses. And this has turned out to be brilliant. These were never used in people before last year. And we have two of them now that are over 90% percent effective in preventing COVID disease. So here are some thoughts for you on these vaccines. So we've tested them all by asking, do they prevent COVID? Which means, do they prevent mild to severe COVID? Not infection, although some of the companies are now looking at infection. But as I said, all human vaccines prevent disease. They don't prevent infection, yet they do reduce virus shedding enough to prevent transmission. That's why herd immunity works. If it didn't prevent transmission, herd immunity would not be a thing. The focus on these vaccines has been neutralizing antibodies. Now, all the companies have assayed neutralizing antibodies and to some extent T cells, but neutralizing antibody assays are really easy to do. You do a plaque assay, right? Many companies have concluded that antibodies are what are going to protect you against serious disease. Now, one of the concerns that has been arising uh, with the emergence of variants of concern, right? These are SARS-CoV-2 variants with lots of mutations throughout the genome and many changes, many amino acid changes in spike. And some of those changes completely uh, remove the neutralization ability of monoclonal antibodies. So you can't use now single monoclonals anymore to treat. You have to use cocktails of two because of this problem. However, most of the T cell epitopes haven't been changed. The T cell epitopes are the peptides displayed in MHC on the surface of an infected cell to allow cytotoxic T lymphocytes to kill the infected cell. Those peptides can be derived from any viral protein, but of course, if you only have a spike vaccine, 
You're only going to get spike T cell epitopes. But nevertheless, in the variants, none of the T cell epitopes are changed. So we have a abnormal focus on B cell epitopes. You know, people are freaking out. Oh my gosh, the variants are changing. The antibodies don't work. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter. The vaccines still prevent hospitalization in death, even where variants of concern are circulating. I heard the head of J&J Research the other day say, you know, our vaccine doesn't give good antibodies against the variants, but it still completely 100% prevents death and hospitalization. Why? Because the T-cell epitopes are still there. And this is how vaccines work. You get infected, whether it's a variant or not. The virus is going to reproduce in your nasopharynx a little bit for a few days until your antibody response kicks in and then reduces the amount of virus, limits spread, and limits disease. At the same time, the T cell memory is kicking in and you're going to get CTLs to kill those infected cells. Get rid of them. And that's why you're protected against disease. And, you know, so far people have been ignoring the T cells and now you're going to be hearing in the next weeks how they're going to save us. I think there's a problem in that. The vaccines are mostly based on spike. I've always thought that was a problem. I want to see other epitopes included, T-cell epitopes from other proteins. And so I think you will see maybe mRNA vaccines with mRNA for nuclear protein and other viral proteins along with spike, or maybe attenuated vaccine. That would be great. That would be all the viral proteins, right? So I think this abnormal focus on spike has in a, in a way led to this variant of concern issue. But in the end, these vaccines are, are going to work for us probably because of the T-cells. Okay. So you can prevent infection with vaccines before it starts, with the exception of rabies, of course. Next time, we're going to talk about antivirals, which you can use to stop an infection after it's begun. Mm -hmm.